Weeding is a very dangerous activity. I know this because my mother never trusted me to weed. My mom would hand me an eight inch sharpened kitchen's knife and let me go to town on chicken. Right? No, no questions asked. She would let me start a bonfire, cook over open flame. She get, let me push a device that was a gas powered rotating metal, sharpened metal blade. I mean, think about a, a lawnmower. That's a pretty dangerous device, right? She gave me the keys to the car this big box of steel, hundreds of horsepower, and let me drive down the highway in the suburbs of Chicago. But she wouldn't trust me to weed. She was right to, 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 to do so. It is that uh, I'm not, I should not be trusted. And I know that I should not be trusted to weed because I tried to weed once. I tried to weed when I got here to Milan. You might remember when Olivia and I arrived here, uh, Olivia still had a year to teach down at South Shelby. She'd signed a contract. And, and so that was first months we were here. We did some landscaping. We went over to Kirksville. We bought these cute little green bushes and we planted the bushes and, and then did some other stuff. And then Olivia went off to her apartment in Macon and here I was by myself in the parsonage for the rest of the week. And, and I wanted her to come home to a good looking lawn. And so I saw some stuff growing up between those little green bushes. So I decided that I would weed. And so I did. And you can see where this goes, because I pulled out Olivia's Asiatic lilies, right? It was a bad, bad thing. Turns out my mother was right. I should not be trusted to weed. I asked Olivia about the details of this, wanted to make sure I was as exact in, in the details of what, what type of lily it was. Actually, I thought it was something else. I wasn't even sure it was a lily. I just knew it was bad. Uh, I had not remembered the details, and I wanted to make sure I was accurate in my confession. Uh, since it's being recorded. And uh, it turns out another member of her family has recently done something similar. There's another family member who is uh, having some major landscaping being done. And in the process, uh, did some weeding just to help the landscapers a bit. And then when another member of the family asked, where are those vines that were supposed to be growing up that thing? You know, the vines, yeah, we, we paid for those, right? Where did those go? Huh. Now, I wonder how many times landscapers get called to say, I'm sorry, I've weeded what you planted. Can you come back and plant it again? How many times a year do you think that happens? Right? Weeding is a dangerous thing. Anyone here willing to admit to having similar weeding catastrophes? Right? Well, oh, very fast. I appreciate that. I'm sure we all have had it at least once or twice. But, weeding is dangerous, and weeding is what we're talking about today, as we're talking about wheat and weeds, right? The parable of the wheat and the parable of the weeds. The wheat, uh, even in the, uh, as it is today in the first century, wheat is the staple food that people depended upon. And we read about how weeds were mixed in with the wheat. And not just any weed, but darnel, which is a, the next picture is a picture of wheat next to darnel. Can you tell the difference between those two? Right? On the right is wheat. On the left is darnel, and they both have that, those same little pellets, but the darnel on the left, it, has, it, it alternates back and forth, and the wheat, it's in a straight line. And you can't tell until it's full grown. And it's full grown, you can look at it and tell. But when it's immature and it has a few of those, you can't tell the wheat from the darnel, the wheat from the weeds. And the problem is, by the time it's grown and mature enough so you can look at it and visibly tell the difference, and you kind of do have to get close, by that point, all the roots are grown into each other. So if you try to pull the weeds out, you're pulling up the, the, the wheat, too. But you have to do something about the darnel, the weeds, because if you harvest that and you don't pull it out, then you've ruined your wheat. So this is a real problem in, in the first century. You really don't want to find weeds among the wheat. You can take that down now. This is a parable that uh, Jesus uses to talk about uh, wheat and weeds. And the parable is a, a way of telling a story that we really don't hear often today. It's kind of a lost format. In the first century, it was common, but uh, we don't, I can't remember the last time, I don't think I've ever heard someone use a parable to make a point. Right? It's not like you, you, you tune into a news conference and someone asks a senator, Senator, can you explain to us the increasing tension between the U.S. and the United, and the U.S. Uh, the, and Russia? And it's not like a senator ever says, "It's like this father who had two sons, 
Right? No one ever uses a parable to answer a question anymore. The only parable that I think I've, I've ever read that um, wasn't from the Bible is actually a parable out of a book of Jewish writing from earlier this century. It's just not common. And so as we begin this month and a half of looking at the parables of Jesus, as the Gospel of Matthew tells them, it's worth taking a few moments to, to just refresh ourselves on what a parable is. Is, right? Parables are rooted in common life. Parables point towards the kingdom of God. They point towards Jesus, the, the king of the kingdom. Yet they point at the kingdom in a way that is just very common. Right? The kingdom of God is like a father who had two sons. The kingdom of God is like a woman who lost a coin. The kingdom of God is like a shepherd looking for a lost Sheep. I mean, this is not exotic, weird things. These are just common life experiences. And no one parable gets everything. Right? If the parables are used to illustrate the kingdom of God, they only ever illustrate an aspect of the kingdom of God. Jesus never says the kingdom of God is, and then tells a parable. It's always the kingdom of God is like. It's a little bit like this. It's a little bit like this, but it's also a little bit like this. We're, it's always kind of getting closer, but not exactly there. The kingdom of God is too vast, grand, and majestic to get our minds completely around it. And so Jesus is always gesturing towards it with these parables, but not ever able just to nail it, because we can't comprehend. The parables are true, and they have in them the seeds of many truths. We can read the parable, and it will speak to us in one way at one point, and if you give it a... a a few days, a few months, a few years, you read it again and it will get to you in a different way. It will speak something differently. And both are true as long as it's pointing towards Jesus and his kingdom. There are at least two or three different sermons I could have preached today based on this parable. I'm going to give you one of them, but there are multiple other sermons that could have been preached on this. Let's see how we might preach, how we might play with this parable today. All right, so first this parable takes evil seriously. Where is evil? Right? Where is evil in the world? We like to think of evil as yonder. Right? Evil is those other folk, uh, other places, other, t other towns or states or nations or, or other places. Yet how close is evil in, in, in this parable? Right? How close are the weeds get to your tomato plants? Right? Right, that, that close, right? That's how far away evil is in the world of this parable. They're as far away as weeds get to our, the wheat, as weeds get to the vegetable plants in our own garden. Right? So evil is not over there. And that helps us understand that we'll never be able to move away and get away from evil. There is no Lake Wobegon. Does, here, who here knows what Lake Wobegon is? Man, I am just flabbergasted. I'm telling you a story from a radio show, right? I'm the youngin' in the room. The Lake, Lake, Lake Wobegon is where all the women are strong, all the men are good-looking, and all the children are above average. The radio show uh, Prairie Home Companion has been running for decades, right? There is no Lake Wobegon we can move to to get away from evil. There is always going to be some weeds amongst the wheat. Right? Where do the weeds come from? The evil one the devil. Jesus doesn't spend a lot of time on this, and the disciples seem satisfied with that answer. The best we can make of this is that uh, even in the good world which God has made, not everything that happens is God's will. Weeds happen. It's not that God planted them. Right? There, are, there are events that don't make sense that are just evil, and it's because they don't make sense that they are evil, which seems to be a good thing to remember on this day of all days. Now, who gets to weed? Right? Who gets to weed? And when the weeds and the wheat are growing together, who is the one who's going to weed? It's not any of us. Right? We don't get to weed. Right? <clears throat> it's not the wheat. It's the wheat doesn't get to go after the, the weeds. It's not the servants who gets to go after the weeds. And even if we did, it's not even time to weed. It will take the expertise of angels to weed, and they're not going to do it till it is time for the harvest. Now, I find that to be greatly uh, reassuring because I don't want to be trusted with weeding. I think that I should not be trusted with weeding. I can barely tell the difference between a lily and a dandelion. I am not the one who is going to be trusted to tell the difference between a sinner and a saint. Right? It's just, just not possible. And there is no sort of spiritual roundup. You know, roundup, roundup ready crops. How do, you, how do you weed if you have roundup ready crops? You plant your crop and then you douse it all with roundup and anything that died... That was a weed, right? 
There is no spiritual version of that. We have no ability to have a litmus test. Well, if you didn't do X, you must have been a weed, right? We don't know. We simply don't know. I, I don't know. There have been people that I, have, I thought were the worst of weeds, and they, they changed their lives and turned around and turned into the greatest of wheat. And I know of people who have appeared to be the hardy specimens of wheat and have fallen short. Things are not always what they appear to be. And in doing so, if I was to risk weeding, or if any of us were to risk, risk weeding, there's a risk to us as the wheat itself. Martin Luther points this out. The Martin Luther who uh, puts 95 questions on the door of a church, 16th century, starts the Reformation, splits the Catholic Church and Lutheran Church and all of that. That Martin Luther, when he reads this parable, he points out that they have tried to weed. The wheat took it into its hands to try weeding in that, that time frame, that period, the 16th century. And they persecuted Jews, set fire to the heretics, and crusaded against the Muslims. Muslims. And you know what it did to the wheat? It made them into murderers. Right? When, when the wheat tries to weed, it is against the nature of what the wheat is meant to be. Wheat is not meant to go after other plants. The wheat is meant to be fruitful. So what is the response to the weeds among the wheat, the way the evil is so closely mixed in with all the good in the world? There are two responses. One that is God's, and one that is ours. And it's important to be clear which is which. God's response is patience. Long-suffering patience. As 2 Peter 3.9 tells us, the Lord is not slow about his promise as we think of slowness. The Lord is patient, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God's waiting till the end to judge, not entrusting the judgment to anyone other than the angels he guides. Right? So God is waiting. That's God's response. Our response is to endure and to grow. To not give in the temptation to weed. And we're tempted. You ever think to yourself, wouldn't this be easier if so-and-so wasn't here? Wouldn't this be easier if, you know, if that person would just stop talking? Wouldn't this be easier? Wouldn't this be an easier meeting if that person hadn't shown up? Have you ever thought to that to yourself? I have. I'll admit it. Right? That's weeding. That's, starting to, that's that temptation to, do, to weed. Just spruce up the place a bit. It'd be easier. That's not our gig. We are to trust in God and God's future and to endure that knowing farming is a patient person's activity. We are re reminded by Paul about this. It's in Romans 12. Never pay back evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, be at peace with all men. Never take your revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We endure, and then our second response is grow. We overcome evil by growing and doing what we should do. We grow. If someone sins, my best response is to grow more forgiving. If someone falls short, my best response is to grow more graceful. If someone tries to weed me, my best response is to get more firmly rooted in God's promises. Now, I do need to add a caveat here as we talk about enduring and growing, that this is a hands-off sort of patient approach when it comes to individual relationships, but if you push this parable too far, you can warp its meaning. This is not condoning systemic injustice. When Jesus walks into the temple and there is systemic injustice happening and extortion of every, all the pilgrims who have come to the temple is happening, Jesus doesn't say, let me tell you about the wheat and the weeds. Jesus weaves together a whip and starts making kind of a ruckus there. Right? So this is not condoning systemic injustice. This is looking at individual relationships in the church, in the, in the community. Now, what this parable leads us to consider is that while the church is on the path to the kingdom of God, which is perfect, the church itself is not perfect in itself. We might as well get used to, this, get used to the weeds because, well, has anyone here ever planted a garden where the weeds didn't grow? Right. There are always going to be weeds. Life is always going to have weeds. That doesn't make it wrong. That just means... It's not perfect, and that's how life works. Right? We might as well get used to the reality of weeds, and we really need to resist the temptation to start weeding ourselves. For if we go down that path, right, we are splitting the church 
the body of Christ. Once we start thinking, you know, if only so and so would leave, or just stop, or just, you know, right? We are splitting the body of Christ. And I can tell when I'm tempted to weed, uh, and I was, I, I, I was reminded of this, I was hearing a story last night. A story about how we call people. Uh, when we start calling people names other than their name or, or like a title as a sign of respect, right? when we start t calling people by something else. Uh, in St. Joseph, on the south side of St. Joseph, there was once a lot of uh, mental hospitals there, people with mental problems, and they were all released a while ago, a few years ago now. And so that part of town is the bad part of town, south side of St. Joe. And so they have a way of referring to people like that. They call them 238ers, right? It's, it's the area code you call. It's, it's the phone number, 238. It's the south side of St. Joe. And it's the, the most neutral way to insult people I've heard in a long time. What can you expect of them? He's a 238er, right? It, it's, it's so neutral sounding, but it's so vicious. You're demeaning them. You're, you're weeding them. They're less than. Right? And, and any time that we, we, I find myself using that phrase, you know what, that person, she's just a, or he's just a, you can fill in the blank there, because we all fill in the blank in our own way. Right? When we start saying, you know what, he's just a, we're, we're starting to weed, aren't we? Because we're making them less, less than, than us. We're splitting it into us and them. And it's fascinating because even when you're using someone's name, I've been in situations where someone says, you know, you can't trust them because, you know, they're just a, and then they use the last name because we'll just like parse out a whole family. They're just, you know, that them, right? right? That's when we're starting to weed. Right? Instead of weeding in whatever form it takes, whatever, whether it be the subtle dismissals that show up in our language, or whether it is the more direct attempts that we are tempted to make to get people just to go away, Right? We are called to be a community that does something else. We are called to be a community that endures and then focuses on, focuses on growing ourselves. As we continue to strive towards being the place where all people can thrive, all people can be bountiful, so that we can be the church where wheat thrives and weeds have a chance to change their ways. Amen. We now come to a time when we confess our faith, and so I will invite you to stand and join me as we confess together using the words of the Apostles' Creed.